Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you today to uh, the answers that we can give you that you've submitted for the vaccine mandate. I have Lynn Yegi here, our chief nursing officer. I'm William Mahoney. I'm the hospital president. Dr. Karasan Woods, she's an OBGYN, and Dr. Cody Hoflicker is a uh, hospitalist here at Cox Medical Center Branson. So you submitted some questions that we want to answer today. I did want to go over a few points before we got started. Um, we know there's a lot of anxiety around this issue. We also want to thank you for sticking with us and being concerned. Um, we realize that the issues here have been politicized. Our responses aren't going to be Democrat. They're not going to be Republican. They're going to be we want to connect and reduce your anxiety by answering questions that you had in the best way that we can. Um, we're all vaccinated, and we're going to keep our mask on um, just so you know we can uh, follow the rules here that we have at Cox Health. And uh, right now, I'll ask a couple of questions, and each person will grab the mic when it's their turn. And these are questions you submitted. So let's go, with Dr. Hoflicker first. And Dr. Hoflicker, people want to have it explained in easy terms how the vaccine works. Okay, so there's there's three vaccines that are currently being used for uh, prevention of COVID-19. Uh, two of them are mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, both of those vaccines uh, involve an injection of basically instructions that your cells use to make a protein that looks like the spike protein that's on the surface of the coronavirus. Coronavirus gets its name because it has like a crown of spike proteins, coronavirus. So it's instructions for your cells to make the viral spike protein that's on the surface of that coronavirus. So your cells make that protein, not the actual virus, just the surface protein, and your immune system mounts a response to that protein. And so that's why some people have fevers and chills because that is an immune response to that protein. Uh, the next time your body sees an actual coronavirus, it recognizes that protein and it attacks it. So that t it basically teaches your immune system how to fight this virus because it has seen that protein before. So that's how the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines work. The uh, Johnson & Johnson is a similar, uh, similar in that it teaches your body to recognize that spike protein, but it uses a different way to get those instructions to your cells. It uses a weakened adenovirus, just a different type of virus uh, that's been weakened. It's not you know, a pathogenic virus in and of itself. But again, the same thing, it teaches your body to react to that spike protein and attack it. So Dr. Hoflicker, is the Johnson & Johnson kind of like the vaccines we get for the flu? It's similar to the, yeah, it's similar to those vaccines, yeah. So, whereas the mRNA technology is, is newer, so. So Dr. Woods, I gotta ask you a question. This one came across from your people. Okay. Um, one of our employees said, I read a report that said the vaccine can cause spontaneous abortion in mothers less than 20 weeks. Thoughts and, and also maybe how this will jeopardize fertility? Yeah, so um, the nice thing is that ACOG, which is American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, really kind of went in and said, okay, we've we've seen these like Facebook posts and Twitter feeds, hey, you know, it changed my menstruation and then people then started to think it affected their fertility. So far, ACOG has done a few, a few studies that have said, no, the vaccine itself does not impact your fertility. Now we have seen a few case reports where maybe their periods were a little bit heavier after receiving the vaccination and we can talk to our patients about that before they actually get their shots say hey that first period afterwards may be a little bit heavier we're not sure if that's just related to the vaccine or the fact that people are stressed about getting their COVID shot too right because it can get di many different mixed messages as to why we get changes in our menstruations as far as the report about um, increased risk of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage prior to 20 weeks of gestation there was a very nice JAMA article that came out that said no in fact you're not really seeing you're not seeing any increases in those miscarriage rates okay and they're even looking by age right because how old you are also impacts how how at risk you are for like a miscarriage older. right so like if you're older or older than the age of 40 to 45 you have an 80 percent risk of miscarriage okay. in the first trimester right without the, vaccine. without the vaccine right that's just without the vaccine so it doesn't the the rate of miscarriage does not change after you're administered the vaccination and at this point in time we also are recommending 
recommending that all of our pregnant patients receive their COVID vaccination as far as either Pfizer or Moderna, right, at any point in pregnancy. We just don't have enough data yet to really say whether or not to support Johnson & Johnson. Okay, great. Hey, Lynn, I got a question for you here. Um, whenever we have employee forms, Lynn's always the one that says we need to reduce anxiety with aid and things. I thought this was a anxiety anxious question. Virus has a 97% survival rate. Why should I risk getting sick from a vaccine? Mm -hmm. So I think 97% is all relevant, right? You may survive the illness, but it, you may have long-term effects. And I think that's probably something we don't talk about very much with COVID. So if you are recovering from COVID and you were seriously ill and you required a lot of oxygenation, what we're seeing is patients are really struggling to get off of oxygen and return to their activities of daily living. And I think the patients that have really been impacted are ones that I may not have predicted would not do as well. You know, I think often with this disease, we immediately thought the immunocompromised, the COPD patients, people like that, that we know already have debilitation would not do well with COVID. But we're also seeing healthy people that we would not have expected to do poorly did. And then they leave and then they have to go home on oxygen. They have long-term effects and it takes months to recover. Some wind up in rehab trying to just gain their strength back because they are so debilitated. So yes, survival rate is 97%, but you gotta think about what that survival is. And then the 3% is death, is permanent. So to risk that, it doesn't make sense to me for your family and your loved ones. But I think the vaccine risk and side effects, you know, I think to Dr. Hoflicker's point, if you have a response to the vaccine, a fever, whatever that is, that's a sign of a healthy immune system and that you're responding as we would expect. So those few days of fatigue or discomfort are nothing compared to the course of COVID and the damage that it does in the long term too. You know, it's nice to talk about deaths. I just looked at the New York Times as of September 10th, 11,574 people in Missouri died and 661,000 in the U.S. I think one thing we all can say, most people know someone who died of COVID. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, yeah. mm -hmm. the doctor, Dr. Burwoods? No, no, you can use the mic microphone. Oh, thank you, yeah. So we all know someone who's probably died of COVID, especially when you see 661,000 people in the U.S. already have had that. Well, since I got the mic, a question I guess that's come to me, do doctors in the hospital make money off of each COVID patient vaccine they administer? No, we do not. I think a lot of people believe that hospitals are just like money machines. You know, we have margins, uh, rural hospitals, one to 2%, uh, I think in the Midwest, I would say. And what we saw during COVID is we saw a big jump in cost of uh, masking, gloves, pr uh, the protective equipment, labor. Lynn, what are we paying, 170 bucks an hour for traveling nurses a and up? Um, we're paying overtime for people. Uh, we didn't have to pay for the vaccine. That was provided by the government. So these excess costs um, have uh, made it very hard. But no, we're not making money in doc the hospital. I know the doctors aren't making money off this. This is more of an Internet uh, rumor that's gotten spread on and on to people. Here's a question that I think would be better for a doctor to answer. I already have COVID. Therefore, I have antibodies. Why do I need the vaccine? All right. So, so far, we don't know how long the protection, natural infection, will last. So we don't know how long it will be before you can get that COVID again. We all get colds, you know, and we get colds again. We, so that natural immunity does not last forever for a variety of reasons. Uh, so far, the studies show that the protection from the vaccines lasts, I mean, we're what, nine months into vaccines. So, so far that protection is lasting nine months. Uh, so it's thought that the protection from the vaccine will last longer than protection from natural infection. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Try to get there. No. Okay. Um, here's one, Dr. Wood, you could do what you wanted. Okay. The rumor out there is you're fixing death certificates to say people died of COVID. Well, that would be an interesting question because I don't actually deal that much with death. So that might be something. Uh, I can. You Dr. Dr. Hoflicker, maybe. And I'm glad being an yeah. OBGYN, yeah, you don't. Yeah, we don't. So, uh, no, I, I don't 
fix death certificates to say people died of COVID. If they died of COVID, I say they died of COVID. If they died of something else, I, I say what they died of. I mean, I can't lie. That's a that's a legal document. I, you're not permitted. So I'm gonna ask this question. I come in the ER and I have a heart attack, but I also have COVID. Do you say that I, what do you say on the death certificate and I die? I mean, it depends on what's going on at the time. If you're manifesting symptoms of COVID-19, because COVID-19 can cause, I mean, I've seen it cause blood clots. I've seen it cause strokes. I've seen it cause all kinds of things. So it depends on the situation and the doctors will do the best they can to figure out what happened in that circumstance. But it's, it's you, you have to evaluate that person in that case. But if there's no benefit to you for saying No, I, I don't get any benefit from saying it's COVID if it's not. And, and sometimes it's unclear because there are so many, you know, uh, there are so many complications that go with COVID, uh, especially with blood clots. You know, I've seen, I've seen strokes, uh, seen, you know, elevated troponin, so heart enzymes, you know, of myocardial distress in people that are that sick. And so sometimes it's hard to say, okay, what exactly killed them? But all of that comes back to their COVID-19 infection. So you're trying to get a unifying diagnosis. But if you did not, if, if COVID is not part of the picture, then it's not part of the picture. And I, I cannot, either legally or from a conscience standpoint, lie on, on a legal document. Okay. Here's another good question. I think this has to do with the teenagers. Why push the vaccine to teenagers <laughs> when they have been reports of them having heart problems after the shot? I mean, ultimately, teenagers are in a place where there are lots of people packed together, schools, right? Um, so ultimately, it still is going to be more beneficial for those kiddos to go ahead and get vaccinated just because they're at risk because they're so packed together in schools. Um, and again, that's where we really should be going by those CDC guidelines that, hey, even those who are vaccinated, you should still be wearing your masks to try and prevent the spread amongst the kids. Because we are seeing significantly more teenagers and younger kids who are requiring hospitalization. So is there that theoretical risk of heart problems after vaccination? Of course, but overall, you're still gonna be safer with a COVID vaccine. And again, as soon as I can get an emergency use authorization for less than 12, sign my kiddos up, so. And, and COVID itself can cause. Yes, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and just pointing out that COVID itself can cause all of the things we're worried about the COVID vaccine causing. So COVID vaccines have seen, you know, rare cases of myocarditis or thrombosis, you know, blood clots, but those are much, much rarer than the cases caused by actual infections. The infection causes those problems with much more frequency than, than the vaccine does. So what I hear you saying, if, if my kid gets this and they become myocarditis, that's easier to treat than yes. say COVID? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Lynn, I got one for you here. Why does the hospital report number of COVID cases, deaths to the media, but not heart attacks, cancer, baby births? Well, number one, there's an interest, right? Oh, yeah. People want to know how many people are dying of COVID. And the reality is we have to report every death that's tracked by the state. They watch all deaths. So to Dr. Hoflicker's point, they're looking at what that diagnosis is and they categorize it. As a country, we have always reported stats out on cancer kills this many people a year. That's how they're getting that information. Mm -hmm. Those things have never been secret. They've always been reportable. Um, with COVID, because we're in a pandemic, it is important to keep track of that and see what we're seeing and changes in the, the spikes. And just as we experienced not too long ago, we had another uptick, right, in cases. And so we're monitoring that very closely. Every state in the, in the country does that. And we're not unlike any of the others. It's required by law. Okay. Okay, here's one that I, here's a question I hear from people quite often. Um, do you use hydrochloroquine or ivermectin to treat patients? If not, can you give us a specific medical reason why you don't? All right. So the question was, uh, if, why don't we use ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine? Yeah. And so the answer is there's no data to convince us that it's, it's effective. Joe therapies. Rogan said it on his show. He's been doing it. Well, you know, he's... He's not, I, so I had, I recruited some pharmacists to look into this for me and they were, you know, they, they look at this data all the time and there actually are pharmacists in our system that review case reports and studies and, and advise us on therapies. And so 
uh, from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, you know, a, a, an objective group, no, no political agenda. There's no published data to date from randomized controlled clinical trials to support the use of ivermectin in treatment or prevention of COVID-19. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's right there. There are some ongoing trials with ivermectin, but so far nothing has said that it's effective therapy. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, I mean, there are numerous guidelines that say that it's not indicated for COVID-19. Uh, NIH COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel recommends against the use of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the in, uh, Infectious Disease Society of America recommends against the use of hydroxychloroquine. So these are people that do this for a living, looking at the data, saying do not use these medications. Basically, the studies aren't showing they're right. working. They're, they're, they're not supporting the use of those medicines. Is this common for patients that you see in the CCU and so as I mean, our employees are asking us this question. Is this a common question for patients and their families? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I get asked for ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine frequently when I'm on the unit. But there's, there's, no, there's no data to say that is effective. And, and actually, hydroxychloroquine may be dangerous. So, so that's why we don't, we don't use those. We don't support their use. That's why vaccination is so important is because I, I wish it worked. I mean, believe me, I wish that I could give you ivermectin and I could make your COVID go away, but that's not just not the case. Prevention is all we got, really. Uh, otherwise, if once you get sick, it's supportive care. It's getting you oxygen however we can get it and, and just letting it ride its course. And that course gets really long and rocky sometimes. So that's why vaccination is so important. So here's a question um, that I think is a, a good one also. Um, Find this one. Here, do you need this? Yeah, if I guess I should. Um, can you be honest and admit you don't know the long-term effects the vaccine are? Well, I think absolutely we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine, but we also don't know the long-term effects of COVID and what those individuals will be facing years from now. You know. I, th I think we said the same thing when the flu vaccines came out. Do we know what the long-term effects are? You know, if we had a crystal ball, this whole year would look a lot different, right? But I think at this point, I'm more concerned with the long-term effects of COVID. Doctors, what do you think about that question? Do you, I mean, they're saying, hey, come on guys, you don't, you don't know the long-term effects. Why are you asking me to get vaccinated? Yeah, so I mean, I think, and I think to Lynn's point, you know, we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccination, but we also don't know the long-term effects of COVID, the virus, right? And so we really need to say, look, how can we prevent that those potentially, I mean, again, death by virus versus a vaccination where we know can prevent significant amount of disease, we should really be thinking, hey, let's go ahead and get our vaccination. And ultimately, eventually we'll find out what those long-term effects are, right? But it's going to take years to know that. And it's really for both. As for both. I don't know if you have more sure to have anything to add. Okay. That's, <laughs> much, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's yeah. the long term message. Okay. Thank you. I got another question. And I hear this one from one of my daughters, my brother. And it says, um, I've already had COVID. Therefore, I have antibodies. Why do I need the vaccine? I have a body. It's got an immune system. I'm a healthy person. Why the vaccine? And, 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 and that risk of long term effect. So that, that goes back to the point earlier that we just don't know how long that natural protection lasts. And so far, what the research is showing is that the protection provided by the vaccines lasts longer than natural protection. So say you got COVID, the alpha variant, and you know your immune system and everything, and now we got Delta. Mm -hmm. Is it true that getting the vaccine on top of that strengthens you against Delta, which seems to be stronger than the alpha variant? So if you got the alpha variant you you aren't necessarily protected against delta whereas so far the vaccine has proven not as effective as it is against alpha but effective at least at preventing death and hospitalization with a delta variant so alpha was what time frame that would have been well first off so yeah like last winter uh into March spring December, yeah yeah and then we got the spike yeah. back up that was the delta uh, this most recent spike was Delta with us, yes. Started in India and then came over. Yeah. Okay. And the shedding of the virus is different when you've been vaccinated. And Lynn, 
Yeah. What do you mean by shedding of the virus? So you are vaccinated and you're exposed to Delta virus. Even if you have it, because you've been vaccinated, there are studies showing that you are shedding less and as intense, if that's the right word. But that's what we're finding right now is your exposure is going to be um, not as impactful to someone as if someone has not been vaccinated. Another question that, that's in here um, is the VAERS report. The FDA and CDC have a, you self-report. It's open-ended. And it, um, they said people have died from the vaccine and have permanent disabilities. Why are you not being transparent about this? I would just tell you, I looked it up just because I wanted to see this. And there was a great video that they did in Indianapolis on this. And basically the numbers that were reported in this question, they're not true. They've had people on the VAERS report uh, put things like, I got, uh, aliens came and got me. I turned green. Um, they had a person who had cancer who got the shot like, you know, um, and then two weeks later died, but they'd had cancer for a year and a half and were stage five. So they said, those reports are self-reported, very open-ended. And again, they said, we just, a lot of this stuff is not verified. Anybody have any other things to add about the VAERS report? I mean, I, I, I went to that site also just to try to find that data. And, and there's actually a disclaimer on the VAERS site that says this is not, you, you know, anyone can report anything. It's, it's meant to be a high sensitivity alarm system to pick up if there is a widespread problem to, to identify it. That's why it's there. The, the drawback is that anyone literally can say anything for any reason and so they have to go back and verify that through records and that process takes time so but yeah there's there's a disclaimer on that website that says this is not this data is not in its final set it's not entirely reliable those death reports thank you got another question here um this was a statement kind of says we need more public public education on the antibody treatment and what to do if we get COVID. All we seem to do is push the vaccines. Is that something you think we'll be seeing more and more of as, as time goes along? The different antibody uh, treatments? Okay. We have an antibody infusion clinic. We do, but yeah. I think what they're looking for, and this is probably gonna be for you to answer, okay. is you know that time frame when they're most effective, why don't we treat them, uh, everybody? Okay, so, so we're trying to vaccinate people when they're healthy, before they become sick. Uh, that's when vaccines work. That's, that's when we want to do it. The Regeneron, uh, that is given currently to people that are manifesting symptoms but not sick enough to be in the hospital. So you're not yet needing oxygen. You're not yet needing those more aggressive interventions, so it's not that severe. That's the, the window to give Regeneron. And we do have uh, infusion clinics set up to give that. I mean, it's it, I see them I see them every day down in the CDU. They're they're giving Regeneron treatments, so that that's when we want to give that before the virus has severely affected you. So your body can help with it, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. And before the damage is done. Okay. And we prevented people from being hospitalized. As a result of it, they're prevented from being hospitalized in the progression of the disease. And when you're when you're saying you know when when they're uh, it hasn't gotten into the lungs as much and things like that, so the medicine can work with their body to help them. Okay, um, you know, there's a lot of good answers here, a lot of good questions. Um, you know, when I look, I, obviously you can get political. You can read the national reports, and there's people that say things differently at different times. You know, whenever I look at what's being sent out by Cox, Mercy, KU, different places I've gotten information on. They all show greater than 95% of the people that are in the hospital sick with COVID are unvaccinated. I mean, I can't find a place anywhere that that's not the case. Is that what you're also seeing? Because I'm not trying to look at the national stuff. I'm trying to say, what do I see? So when somebody asks me a question, I can look at the eye and say, no, that's not accurate. I mean, we're trying to follow the science, okay? Patients have said, hey, I feel a little uncomfortable coming. I want to delay my care because I'm not sure who's vaccinated, who's not. And there's rumors around all that too. But the one that really hits me is we, we look at the reports, the number, I mean, here's, here's, a, here's a graph from, from Steve right here that shows how many in the CCU, how many on ventilators. And I know the people that put this together for them. 
Okay. Are you seeing the same thing? Is it mainly about everyone you see who's in the hospital with COVID is unvaccinated? Yeah, I mean, far and away, the majority of the people I'm taking care of in the in the hospital are unvaccinated. Uh, I've taken care of in this whole thing, going back to the beginning of this, I've seen two people. I, I can because I remember them clearly. Uh, I've taken care of two people that were vaccinated that had COVID, and I've taken care of. I don't even know how many COVID patients I've taken care of, but in the course of the pandemic, it's a whole lot more than two. Uh, and both of those two individuals had uh, it, malignancies with their it, hematologic malignancies, so blood blood cancers that probably prevented them from mounting an immune response to anything, the vaccine infections, pathogenic infections. So th those I mean, that's that's literally it uh, in terms of vaccinated patients that I've taken care of. So we're going to go to the last round here. I'm going to answer a question. I want you guys just to give whatever you want. Um, the question is, your advice employees say they'll leave if they have to get vaccinated or just about the vaccine. Any last 30 second thing you want to say and we'll go around. So the closing round table. All right. So I, I know there's a lot of anxiety about the vaccine and, you know, I I can understand it because it uh, it is newer technology and it's just a high anxiety time but it comes down to you know I, I've been a, a member of this community since I was a child and I've been a physician in this community uh, for 15 years uh, and I've, I look at the data and I care about the community and I have asked everyone I love to get the vaccine and I will continue to do so uh, just because I think that's the safest way uh, to keep us all safe from this. Dr. Woods? If I can do something a little bit different than the closing arguments, just simply, um, I wanted to kind of put in there a little bit about, so what happens, so COVID and pregnancy, right? Because that's what we're, you know, we need to talk about that as well. And um, there's a significant amount of anxiety for my pregnant ladies out there who are like, okay, what do I do, right? So my husband, maybe he travels or maybe he works at a desk job and nobody at his office actually wears masks or is vaccinated right and so it's really i'm wanting to talk to my ladies about you if you're pregnant especially if you're pregnant you really need to be getting your covid vaccination we know that there's an increased risk for stillbirth i don't know if everyone's seen that article that came out of mercy about the still the late term stillbirths right so it's it's a real thing right those girls were all healthy and they still had I their stillbirths i clearly understood what you meant by that yeah. so um so they got they were tested for COVID positive, right? So um, uncomplicated pregnancies, they had they may not have been symptomatic, so they may have been asymptomatic, COVID positive, and they had stillbirths in the late third in late third trimester. So we're seeing an increased risk in those stillbirths, right? Closer to term, right? Of people not vaccinated. Of of people who have COVID, COVID. right? Because the pregnant ladies, right, have been they have not been as aggressive at getting COVID vaccinated. Okay. Right, so those ladies are gonna be your cohort where you're seeing a lot more disease in the pregnant ladies because they're not being vaccinated yet. So now we're trying to, to say, look, you've got SMFM, which is the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. You've got ACOG, right? All of us who are saying, look, you really need to be COVID vaccinated, especially when you're pregnant, simply because you're seeing an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. The preterm births and deliveries are actually indicated, right? A lot of those are indicated, meaning she's sick, we gotta get the baby out. Therefore, there's a preterm delivery. Right? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Um, so stillbirth, hypertensive disorders, postpartum hemorrhage, right? So you're seeing those increased risks of maternal morbidity and mortality related to COVID infection, okay? And since, again, we didn't, they didn't do the studies with pregnant ladies, right? That's, that's something that we are trying to advocate for our patients to the NIH is, hey, you actually need to be doing more studies on pregnant ladies with vaccination. Um, but we are advocating for please pregnant ladies get your COVID vaccination to try and prevent some of these significant maternal morbidity and mortality. So that is my plea to my pregnant ladies. So my question was earlier, you said about the stillborn, yes. you said about the stillborns of mercy. I didn't catch that. So that's it. So that was a KY3 <laughs> article that okay. Dr. Johnson, Chandria Johnson, um, who's one of the OBGYN hospitalists up at Mercy, who was kind enough to talk to KY3 and put out the data that they were seeing early in August from their facility just to try and help 
um, get the word out to our pregnant ladies, hey, look, this is a real thing, right? We really need to be talking about COVID vaccination in our pregnant populations. So I'm just trying to kind of piggyback off of what what she was talking okay. about through okay. KY3 at Mercy. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to make the plea. Right. Pregnant ladies, get yourselves vaccinated. I know that it is a political issue at this point, which it should not be. But really talk to your significant others. Talk to your family members. We want to cocoon you and the baby and really say, look, you, you if, if if you want to help protect me and the baby, you should be getting COVID vaccinated. Right. And ignore the politics. OK, Lynn. You know, I think um, to your point, Dr. Woods, I said to a rotary group this week, COVID is not red or blue, it, it is a deadly disease. And if I could save one person from going through that, I'd do it, right? As nurses, we take care of patients, that's our job. For me, as a chief nurse, it is to take care of the staff and the patients. And I can't in good conscience say, um, don't take the vaccine. Because when I have patients say to me, I'm so relieved you're doing this mandate because I was afraid of who was taking care of me. That's heart wrenching for those of us who have spent our entire career caring for people. So when I have employees who ask advice about the vaccine, I tell them the same thing I would tell my family because they are my family. I want to keep you safe and I would never ask you to do anything that I thought would put you in danger. And for me, the vaccine is keeping you from danger. And so that is my best advice to employees. Do your own research and not through social media. Find reliable literature out there. There's tons of it. I just feel like there's been so much division around it. And the bottom line is COVID doesn't care what your political beliefs are. Um, but I care about you as a person and our workforce depends on you every day. For you to leave this and what you love because of a vaccine, it defies logic. So know that we would never ask you to do something that would put you in harm's way. That's just not what who we are. I'll go back over the question that was sent. Your advice to employees who say they'll leave if they have to get vaccinated. Man, I just ask you to please fill out an exemption. Um, we really are acting with the best information we have. And we are a family here. I mean, I remember the growth from Skaggs. Now this hospital is a great place. We have a great medical staff. We have a great team on here. And um, I was looking the other day at the list I got of who's not vaccinated. And I could not imagine our hospital with those people gone and not here. Um, obviously, it's a personal choice. I'm not for forcing people. I, I don't believe in doing that. I want people to make the decision, as Lynn said, with the information that they have. I, I'm, I'm sickened by all the uh, politics, the various rumors on social media. You know, the, the, someone said, well, they're tracking us. They're tracking you with this, or the drones. They're not tracking you with the chip, let me tell you, um, and stuff. But I just got to tell you, it is uh, heart-wrenching to think that we could have 50, 100, 150 of our employees leave. It will affect us. It will affect us negatively. It'll affect our patients. It'll affect our community. One of the reasons I moved here 11 years ago is because Branson's a very rejuvenating and refreshing place to live. And more and more as the world's gotten weirder. And um, to see people that I know are excellent at their jobs leave is, is heartbreaking. And uh, please just give it a chance and fill out an exemption. If you feel that strongly, just do that. Um, and just say exactly how you feel uh, if you're on the borderline, please get that. Maybe there's some people waiting because you're a leader, you're an influencer for someone else to do that. And um, I I'm in meetings. Nobody's trying to do something to get anybody. It's not like that. It's just trying to do what they can with the information they have to do the best thing for our patients. And that's, that's the bottom line right there. And uh, I appreciate all you coming today, uh, answering questions. I appreciate the questions that have been asked. Uh, they're, they're very heartfelt. People just really want to know, hey, I need all the information I can so that I, I can do what's right for my family. And uh, I totally understand that. Um, you know, I, I think about these uh, young women, and I have four daughters in that age who are childbearing years, and think, what happens if? You know, that's scary. And then that gets played on 
you know, on the, on the media and the social media, it just makes things, you know, it's all over the place. And you wonder why people are anxious. It, it does cause anxiety. But again, we are just trying to do the best thing we can with the information we have. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And hopefully we said some things that could uh, reduce your anxiety and help you. Uh, thank you very much.